find the, the sign up link for the video. Can you repeat the link, please, in the in the chat? Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, sure. Sure. So one more time, and there we go. Uh, let's see. This one? There we go. Everyone in the room? Yeah, I hope that she, she got now. So, Gustavo, I am here. Oh, okay. Yeah, you, you, we still have a couple of minutes if you want to <laughs> give your All final right. remarks. There we go. Thank you so much. I would, I've, I'm so sorry that my network was um, tripping towards the end of the session. So I was not here to catch up on no the last thing said, but I'm sure that Asha got them. And I want to say thanks to everybody who contributed. This session was more of us gathering insights from various people to understand how best to help teachers prepare learners for the future of work. And I've been able to note down a number of things that I'm even going to action from my own end. I hope that for everybody who has contributed or who has listened, you've also been able to pick one thing or a couple more that you're going to maybe pass on to a teacher in your community. Or if you're a teacher in the room, perhaps you would also use in your classroom to ensure that learners are better prepared for the future of work. So thanks. And to my co-facilitator, Christabel, thank you for doing this with me. Thank, Thank you very me. much, Abigail. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> Thank you. So let's let's wait for three minutes just to wait for people to come. Sure, sure. <laughs> Yeah, and by will, the way, if I you don't mind, I, I, I will I will, I will, be I will in share this the one screen. as well. Um, I will share the screen for the other session, okay? Um, let me see here. Let me see here. Okay, can you, you see? Go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, here we are. So I think it's five o'clock. Are we clear? Yeah. yeah. I think okay. it's should... okay. Can we start? Right. Um, I'll just go ahead. Oh. All right. 
Okay, welcome on board. Good after uh, good afternoon for me who is in Brazil. Good after good morning for those who are, you know, on the on the on the west and for good night for the the, the evening people. Uh, I'd like uh, to introduce myself. I am uh, my name is Rosa Alegria. I represent the Teach the Future movement. I'm a futurist. Uh, Teach the Future is a global uh, non-profit working uh, uh, NGO to include futures literacy in the school curriculum. And uh, this session is hosted by Teach the Future and Young Voices Network in partnership with the Millennium Project. World Futures Day is a 24 hour of intergenerational conversations about the future, a space to involve young people and in anticipating and influencing the future, both in and out of school. So this is, uh, as you, some of you, some of some of you know, uh, intergenerational version of the classic World Future Day that is being promoted for more than ten years by the Millennium Project. Okay, we we offering this session because we believe that uh, youths must be on on the table. Uh, speaking loud, uh, their voices, and we should, more than uh, uh, talking about them, we should listening from them. So this is a pleasure to have here an inter intergenerational pair. Um, the youth facilitator is Akancha Prasad. I'm so sorry that I'm pronouncing bad. Akancha Prasad? No, that was uh, perfect. Okay, <laughs> Akancha is currently a high school senior aspiring to enter the field of law. She currently studies history, business and economics at A level. Since attending the Dubai Future Forum, she has been more conscious about what the future looks like and how youth as the next generation can influence it. As more advancements are being made in several sectors, especially technology, it's important to think about ethics along with how society will evolve in the future. So welcome, Akansha. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here in a, such a very important uh, topic for the humankind. Now I will introduce the adult facilitator. I know Sabrina from some events that we've been uh, talking uh, presentially. Sabrina, welcome board. Sabrina Epps, it's her name. Uh, she is an APF Emerging Fellow board member of Teach the Future and Transnormal Institute. Sabrina is a leadership advisor and coach who integrates future thinking and strategic foresight into leadership practice. Sabrina's research interests lie in future systems of education, learning, from industrial colonial to emanci emancipated and generative. So uh, some additional information. Um, this hour will envision possible human rights futures by exploring policy making, lawmaking, leadership, AI, education, and so on. So as you think uh, about possible futures for humans and non-humans, what must our leaders embrace to ensure people uh, that people are protected as more of our lives are integrated with technology? So I will be putting this uh, summary in the chat and uh, give the floor to, uh, to, to, to our younger uh, speaker, Akansha. Akansha. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to be here. I've been following along since this morning. And so far, this conference has been amazing to experience some really cool sessions have been uh, going on. Um, sorry, can I please uh, get co-host um, so I can share my screen? We have some slides. Okay. Let me see here, how can I do that? Um, I'm sorry. Click on participants and on, uh, by her name, you can make her a co-host. Uh, okay. And while you're doing that, I'll just say that even though we we have literally like a handful of slides, 
And it's really with just with um, prompts because we really want to have a conversation. I see so many young people here and I'm really excited to hear your perspectives um, about the topics that we'll discuss today. So feel free at any point, everybody to come on screen um, and unmute yourselves. And we want to hear from you. That was the whole impetus of um, our time together today. Hey, Scott. So can I, uh, is it uh, allowed to record or not? What is the the order here? I can't see her name, but I cannot see the co-host allowance. Are there like three dots by her name? Yeah, it is okay, Akansha. Um, okay. Yeah. She's, she can share now. Go ahead, Akansha. Yeah. You have? Yeah, yeah, okay, I've got sorry, it. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you. No, Thank no, you. Oh, uh, sorry, just one minute. I just need to. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yeah, wonderful. So today uh, we're talking about the future of human rights. And we realize this is a very broad topic, which is why we've narrowed it down into some a few general ideas like education, policy making that we'd really love to explore with you guys. Um, so a lot is happening in the world right now. Um, and a lot of it concerns human rights. So we think this video, we have a video to show you, and we think this video will be really like informational and really it sets a good like introduction to what we're looking to uh, talk about right now. So as we embark on the crucial task of reforming or should I say comprehensively reforming the United Nations Security Council to better reflect the realities of our world. The clarion call for equity, which will be the focus of my presentation, resonates louder than ever. I am most grateful to the L69 chair for leading us on the L69 model and wish to supplement that presentation with six arguments why equity must be the cornerstone of our efforts. First, the principle of equal opportunity for all. Co-chairs, you will agree with me that equity demands that every nation, irrespective of its size or power, be afforded an equal opportunity. And I stress the word here, equal opportunity to shape global decision making. As has been wisely stated, more than ever before in human history, we share a common destiny. We can master it only if we face it together. Our question, therefore, is how much longer? How much longer will the will of five members continue to override the collective voice of 188 member states? This must change. My second point, redressing centuries of injustice. Co-chairs, I think we might all broadly agree that the historical injustices perpetrated against the Global South can no longer be ignored. And it is time, and it is time to rectify these disparities by ensuring greater representation for regions like Asia, Latin America, and Africa on the United Nations Security Council through a reform in both its categories, permanent and non-permanent. Indeed, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And that was Ruchira Kamboj, the permanent representative of India to the United Nations. And this quote, originally said by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in 1963, um, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And we'd really like to break that down with, uh, like, with the next question, especially. Um, so 
we're going to move on and open the floor to everyone now. So please weigh in and please let's have a discussion. This is meant to be like a conversation. So our first question for today, some food for thought, how can policymakers accommodate for the futures of our ecosystem? Um, in that video, uh, Ms. Kamboj outlined six ideas, but before we look through those, um, does anyone have like any ideas? Or what's happening where you live in terms of policymakers and um, how they're making policy now and what the implications would be on the future? Does anybody have maybe one um, example of, of that? And just come off mute. Brian put in the chat the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act. You want to say something about that, Brian? Yeah, yeah. It's the most stupid name for a law in a long time because um, it's not really about inflation or uh, inflation reduction. Um, but this is a massive American uh, federal spending bill that includes a huge cash infusion into a wide range of uh, climate change causes. Uh, everything from supporting uh, carbon drawdown to funding um, electrification. Um, it, it just seems like a, a real, real major achievement. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Brian. Anyone else? We'll take one more before we move on to the six areas um, that the whole video. Um, and Akancha, if you get a chance, can you put the, the YouTube uh, link so that people can see? It's an actual oh, yes, six minute video. But we wanted to basically, she um, really encapsulated kind of one area of um, policy making or one area of inclusion or the lack thereof in that, you know, five member states um, are actually making decisions for 188 members. And so clearly where we live, I'm sure we've seen where the minority of, of people are making the majority of the policies that impact um, the rest of us. And so how do we start to change the tide with that? And Akancha just put the, the um, link to that YouTube video in the chat. Anyone else? I saw a couple of things in chat, a couple of comments in chat. Um, Louise put in the chat, laws against Amazon rainforest defloration. Uh, yeah, that's that's a really good one, especially considering how many different types of uh, inhabitants make the Amazon rainforest their home. Like this is definitely something we need to be thinking about in the future, not just us as the civilized society. We need to be thinking about those who don't want to make that step, who want to stay rooted in their uh, culture, in their way of life. And recognize that the um, the solutions, particularly to um, issues of conservation, you know, to sustainability um, and taking care of the land, resides with the people who dwell there. And yes. so, you know, not only just um, making policies that impact, but also, you know, um, bring people who are part of you know, part of the land, people who are indigenous to the land, bring them into the conversation because they have the wisdom that will, you know, that will um, have the solutions and actually know how to restore the, the land itself. So um, as well as water, as well as the air and as well as, um, you know, the vegetation and um, animals and all that stuff. <laughs> so- Hanging um, off of that, um, I really agree. Like the people who live there know exactly how to maintain that land. It's like something I read about languages earlier. Like so the, one of the reasons some of the oldest languages on earth, like Sanskrit, don't have exact English translations is because they were made for a different type of lifestyle. So mm -hmm. the modern English that we speak right now will not accommodate for the lifestyle that Sanskrit um, speakers used to have. So yeah. that's a really good thing to like uh, think about. 
Scott says extremely short-sighted um, and that there needs to be thought beyond four to five years. Absolutely, Scott, I agree. And need to have a wide um, multidisciplinary background and approach. You're absolutely right about that. Um, someone else had... Kelly uh, says um, a nature-based solution for climate change and the need to take um, a systems and equity perspective to ensure we are considering who benefits and how to protect biodiversity. Yes, this is an amazing point. Like we need to be thinking about who actually benefits. Like if it's just the people who fund political campaigns, does that really affect everyone? Like what about the majority of people who are living maybe on minimum wage or just above it? Like do these uh, policymakers do re really understand like what life is like for people at the bottom and how really does and you know what well, here's another limitation about language and I'm glad you said that Akancha is um is you know even how we talk about people so you know for example um Isabel Wilkerson wrote a book called Cast and that's been turned into a movie called Origin and in our normal, um, normal, huh? in our vernacular, you know, particularly in the English language, it's built into the language. So like you just said, people who are at the bottom are people. And I'm not saying I'm not judging you, but what I'm saying is the language is set up that way. So even as we're having these conversations, I think it's really important that we start to hear how the language works so that we can capture that in um, in policy making, because I can tell you, I have seen policies that even in the, you know, that are quote unquote meant to reform something or make thing improvements, but the way that they talk about the people for whom um, the policies are being made, they, they make them sound like they're, they don't have any agency. And so I think that's a huge piece of it is, is language. Um, is I it totally agree. Sadia said absolutely they should have a say in what goes on um, in their environments. We are not the ones inhabiting those areas. Exactly. Someone had asked about Sanskrit. Did you want to have a quick? Um, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, San is, sorry. Um, Sanskrit is just how um, Latin is the mother of uh, most Western languages nowadays. Sanskrit is the mother of um, Indian languages, you could say, like um, from that South Asian languages. Um, so it's basically the root of languages such as Hindi and stuff. It's a dying language once again, but that's just how it is. Like it's a, a, our language has evolved, our society has evolved. Sanskrit does not fit the needs of our society at the moment. Right. Um, Collegio talks about um, am animal trafficking and how um, many of the animals in Brazil are coming to extinction because of illegal pounding. Um, so certainly as we talk about rights, we do need to talk about rights of all living things, um, and, you know, as in addition to human rights, which is why we use the, the term futures of ecosystems. Thank you everybody for what you're putting in the chat. And again, we we can certainly have a conversation with the two of us, but we definitely want to hear from you. So um, if anyone wants to come off of mute and, and say what they put in chat or um, or say their um, their point, we would love to hear it. Do you want to go to the six yeah. areas? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so Miss Cambodge outlined these six areas in that video. I think it's a really great watch. So please go ahead and watch that if you're interested. But basically, the points she outlines, the first two we've already seen, that policymakers must promote equity and show bold leadership. And what she means by bold leadership is not be afraid to take a stance that maybe some other countries are not taking at the moment. Like, we don't see lots of countries in at the moment talking about futures. We're only thinking about the short term, the present. And I feel like more countries should be thinking more about what decisions we make right now, like how are they going to affect us later on and that sort of thing. Um, the third point is that policymakers must share a vision for an equitable and inclusive world. And lots of people I saw in the chat were talking about something similar. 
uh, yeah, and we've got to eliminate justice, amplify diverse voices. Again, points we're already hearing. So we're already having this collective thought about it. And that's really, that's making me really happy right now. We're on the same page over here and we're all thinking about the future in a way that will benefit all inhabitants of the planet. Finally, we've got expand power and decision making. And I think that once again ties in with bold leadership. Like we need to be thinking more about the future in the decisions like countries are making at the moment. Um, how uh, how has my schooling supported me in this work? We're getting, um, <laughs> that's a good question. We uh, asked you the same question, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I. I wouldn't say like my schooling currently has supported me in thought about future. And I think that's something that I find really great about Teach the Future. Like the organization itself is trying to bring this sort of thought into school. But um, outside of schooling, I've done a lot of my own research. Uh, and I think that got me really interested in human rights and the future as we know of it especially attending the Dubai Future Forum, as was mentioned, like way back. I met um, Miss Lisa over there and it was amazing to talk with her after that and think more about the future. Yeah. So Francisco mentioned policies that avoid wars um, happening, violence needs to be stopped. Francisco, you want to come on and talk more about that? Um, because again, this is a, you know, the, the video is a UN meeting and, um, or, and it's the security council talking about the security council. And so I'd love to hear from you what you see in the future in terms of how policymakers can get to a point where they stop focusing on war and, and actually start thinking about global, um, globalization of peace. Well, and uh, else wants to come on. Go ahead, Francisco. Hi. So I believe that uh, countries often focus on making wars only to expand their territorial, uh, their territorial land, but they don't really focus on how their people should be feeling. It is an absurd that we still, in the 21st century, we allow that the United Nations Security Council uh, permits the... Russian Federation to invade Ukraine. The, like, uh, I understand that they are complex, but the United Nations shouldn't be something that can be biased. Having the veto power inside the United Nations is something very unfair. And I believe that is something that needs to be changed. Because currently, a country can't even defend themselves if one of the five countries vetoes it. And Russia, for example, has been vetoing a lot. The United States has also vetoed the, uh, the addition of the food right in the human rights. That is also absurd. So I personally believe that we should stop with the veto powers. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have something to add? Um, I'm seeing a lot about police brutality in the yeah. chat over here. Um, uh, Colegio, I want to say, I'm sorry, am I butchering your name? Um, and Enzo, do you want to unmute and talk about it? Um, um I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but Colegio is actually the name of the school. I mean, it's not a person, oh. so no, no, oh, no, problem. Oh. it's just we, we're signed with the school computer, so that's why most of those have like Colegio, it means like oh, okay. school. Oh, sorry, sorry oh, to interrupt. thank you for telling me. <laughs> No, no, no problem. Um, so do is someone want to talk about, um, I, I think, was it primarily in, um, well, not primarily, but um, we're mentioning it particularly in Brazil. Yeah. I don't know about that um, over the years. How are, you know, how are things changing or what do you see policymakers doing about it? So we have seen countless numbers of police brutality cases in Brazil. <clears throat> and that is something that should be changed because Brazil is not only the fifth biggest country in the world, but we have a very big uh, economic system. And this should be a safe country, but 
we're scared to even go out on the street and walk two blocks because we're afraid that we're going to get mugged. And that's something that should not be happening. But, and, but people tend to say that, oh, Brazil is such a, an unsafe country that police, uh, they have to be, they have to use brutality and violence to make that stop. But it's not necessary. People should have to, uh, people need, the government needs to think about other ways to, to maybe change that and to uh, make Brazil a safer country by um, by ensuring that uh, that we don't um, by ensuring that um, that uh, that we don't get mugged when we go out on the street by ensuring that uh, the the robbers and the thieves are not gonna attack us just because they want to steal our goods they the government should be giving those people opportunities uh work opportunities and other stuff other things to 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 take away that uh that feeling that they need to steal other people uh but yeah that's it thank you enzo you want to go to sure. the next thank slide? you so much yeah um hello hey oh hi Hi. What's your name? Hi. Um, I'm Leo. I'm the guy who was Collegio Biscone. <laughs> Hi, Leo. So sorry. Yeah, yeah so what Enzo yeah. said is true. Many of our problems with mugging are directly rooted to our money and investment problem in the politics. I mm -hmm. mean, for God's sake, our current president was in prison for money and investment some years ago. Mm -hmm. It's absurd, to be honest. And the police brutality, it's even worse. We had a video circulating, I think, three weeks ago about we had a police, yeah, a police officer. Um, he, he was beating up a black man and the black man was arrested after that. It was incredible. It's absurd. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. It's interesting because th these are images that we've been seeing in the United States for a very, very long time. And yeah. so I'm interested in as now that you're the next generation growing up seeing these images. Um, so as we envision the future, what's the what are some of the um, actions that need to be taken? You know, will it take all students all over Brazil coming out of school and, you know, and refusing to, to go to school, you know, because until these things change, until policymakers, you know, make it, make a change, how, yeah. you know, do you wait until you're eligible to vote, to vote in people who are going to defend your interests? How do you, how do you propose to get there to the future that you seek? Well, I think the big problem with the board world for now is that everyone thinks that they're just one person. Well, I can do anything. I'm just a guy. But the problem is, if everyone thinks that, no one does anything. Mm -hmm. We have to think as a collective for once. We need to all make a reunion and agree for something. I mean, humanity is based on collective, right? We need right. to think as one. I mean, I am very befuddled by the Problem with police brutality here because Brazil has one of the most diverse ethnicities that, um, rates in the world. Mm -hmm. Like most of our population is mixed. So for it to be happening here of all places, it's just, it's ludicrous. Right. And if and you know, something, uh, exactly. Sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, something similar was happening in South Africa until the new constitution was um, introduced. It was a white minority making most of the decisions. And that obviously ties in. Like if most of the population is of a mixed like ethnicity, then why is our are like why uh are law enforcers still discriminating against them? Shouldn't it like should this like not be a problem at this point? And that's some really good points you guys have brought up. Thank you so much. Exactly. Um, Top sorry, 1% just... always controls everyone. It's impressive. Like, you've seen the Israel and Palestine problem. They had 14 votes 
support to, to stop the war. Guess what happens? The U.S. put one vote against, and boom, they did with it. And while that happens, in... Israel, yeah. Israel is bombing now Lebanon, Congo, for God's sake. And we don't know when the war will stop. I've seen videos of burnt children on my Twitter feed. Yeah, you have I... to take care of yourself on social media. Yeah. Beatrix? They are screaming Beatrix? for their own liberty, their own freedom. They are impotent to do anything because those people, the people on top, refuse to give them the rights that they deserve. They refuse to give them a chance to show what they really can do. Absolutely. So let's like bring I uh, Beatrice into the conversation because she's been um, waiting. And you can also use your hands in, under the oh, reaction. Okay. Go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I, I mean, I just, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was just going to comment the thing. Um, I think, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't think I can pronounce your name right. I'm sorry. Um, but um, you mentioned, Akansha, okay. So the thing that you mentioned about the majority of like white people, a man, minority of white people like commanding the country, even though the majority is mixed people and everything. And I think that's a consequence of something that we also should be um, thinking about. Uh, th that's the education. I mean, um, at least here in, in Brazil, most, uh, I mean, we are also a majority uh, minority of like really pure white people. Um, we're actually like mixed a bit. But I'd say um, the thing is we don't have much, um, much quality education for those mixed, uh, mixed people. I mean, here. It's kind of the opposite from the United States. So public schools are considered bad, while pub while private schools are good. And um, some of those um, mixed people they can't afford as much because they didn't have the opportunity. Um, and that's why I think the education also um, how can I say it? It affects and I mean if there there are mixed people that didn't have the education, how would they like command? Um, a country and that's why I, I mean it might be a cause of whites always the ma minority of white people who are mostly commanding so yeah yeah and and actually just so you know the I just wrote in the chat the devaluation of public schooling has has been happening since schools were integrated um in this country and so no, it's the same. Everyone, you know, pretty much talks really bad about public education um, and wants, comp thinks that public education should have competition with private and charters. So that's a whole different, that's a whole nother conversation. That's probably the next hour, <laughs> the hour after us. Um, Akancha, do you want to go to the next slide? Yeah. So our next question is, what is the role of lawmaking in innovation while still protecting humans, citizens, and other inhabitants of the planet. And this ties in really nicely with um, what, uh, sorry, who was it? What Luis said about the deforestation of the Amazon rainforest. Like, um, should there be, like, how do you think policymakers should approach lawmaking in relation to other inhabitants of the planet, not just as humans and not just citizens? So once again, please feel free to unmute. Yeah, we'd love to hear you. Hey. Um, hi, can you hear me? Luis? Uh, so I have a yeah. Luis and a Luisa. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> e. Okay, so go ahead, Luis. And then Luisa, you go next. Okay, so when I said about the Amazonian rainforest, the deforestation, um, as we saw in the last years, or as you see in the last years, uh, the rates of deforestation were huge. There were like records every month. And, and recently with the new government, uh, change, change were made aiming to reduce this deforestation. So not only protecting the forest, but also the people that live in the forest. So yes, like cities in the middle of the forest, but also the uh, native uh, communities in, in, in Amazon rainforest. So uh, I think that 
the, the laws and all the government projects that are made to innovate, protect, and um, guarantee the security and continuity of not only the communities, the culture of each uh, the native con community. Uh, all those measures are extremely important. Mm -hmm. And this is just a Brazilian example. We have many countries in the world. Saw someone talking about Malaysia and if it would be very cool if people from other countries comment about it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Luisa? Hi, I am also from Brazil. So I wanted to say something about the Amazon forest. I think that the forest is known for everyone from other countries as the lung of the world. But if you look deeply into it, it's not only the lungs, it's also something that people are extracting and deforestation and doing deforestation actually, because they see it as a way to gain money. It's a way to improve places by like ruining places from other communities, as Luis said. Some native people are losing their places, their safe spaces, because we are so selfish that we don't look into them. We look only into us and we like we deforestate to make things to gain money and not look into them. And I think that's so bad for all of us because we are in 2024 and we are not looking for them. We are looking into us. And I think it's so, so selfish. Thank you. Stella? Stella, you're on mute. Is it your earplugs? Uh, yeah, yeah, we can hear you now. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I totally agree with Louisa about what Louisa said because the Amazon rainforest deforestation is a huge um uh problem from not only Brazil and South America but from the whole but for the whole world. Um because how Louisa said is the lung of the world is then one of the most and oxygen producers, I mean, like, and it's going to be a, like a huge issue if Brazil doesn't, not only Brazil, it's the whole world, doesn't take care of our, uh, of our, is a beautiful forest. And I've never been there, but I really like to that. And I feel like we should really take care of that. And I will, that is, yes, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Beatrice? Um, yes, I would also kind of disagree with what um, Louisa said. I mean, I think it's a bit selfish. It is, but you have to be selfish to achieve things for better people. And we can, we can, we cannot always make everybody happy. Um, I'd say people are not deforestating just for themselves, but also to make the world better. Okay, some people, some not. A lot of people are being. Um, a lot of people suffer with these types of damages, but I also think it's something that we need to make if we wanna, if we wanna not, if, if we want like. <laughs> to make the world, yeah, like to advance, advance a bit. Yes, yeah, so to, to improve and to advance a bit. So I'd say, um, I'm, I'm not saying like I encourage the forestation and everything. No, I'm. I disagree with that also, but sometimes um, there is for, it is for a better cause. I I just wanted to mention that. So, um, Beatrice, yeah. I have a question for you. Um, so yes, uh, do you think development should like be encouraged? If like, sorry, let me rephrase. 
Let me rephrase. What do you think is the future of sustainable development in relation to deforestation and the advancement of our societies? Um, okay, so I think it's kind of like a 50-50 opinion because I also think we should be um, the most sustainable possible. But sometimes, I mean, I'm not saying, um, like, let's make let's make up scenario. Um, if we didn't have place for a new fabric or fabric not, um, yeah, new fabric, and we have to find a place for that. It's better than we deforestate something to um then to lack of something that we also need i mean i'm sorry if i'm not expressing myself correctly but i think we should be the most sustainable possible but sometimes um we can do so much better not being sustainable so i think we have to put it like on a scale i, I don't know if you could understand me yeah yeah no i get i get your point thank you so much um no problem so let's Evelyn? take a couple more and I completely and we'll move on to the next slide. I agree with, um, but, oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to, I to add Evelyn something. I think Evelyn was next. Enzo, I think Evelyn was next. And then I'll have you. Can you put oh, your my here? bad. I'm so sorry. No, no problem. Evelyn? Uh, hello. Hi. Uh, I would like also to mention about the sustainable development goals that in our school, we have been working with that since we're like child. And I think it would be great if every school in the world, public or private, do, do it too, because we, we have this conscience as very little that we have to take care of the world. As an indigenous person talking about the Amazon forest, uh, we know that we've been destroying it practically. And I think the sustainable development goals should, can also, can, help people to, to know better what, what is going on with the world, what are the, the goals they'll have to accomplish. And because there is a thing happening in Brazil ever. No, it's not from now. It's, a, it's, it's been happening for a while. And in a place called Marajo Island, that happens a lot of child abuse. And it's been happening not for now. People have to pay attention for that, not just Brazil, the whole world, because it just doesn't happen in Brazil. And the sustainable development goals should approach every every kind of school in every part of the world. And that's just something I would like to mention. Thank you, Evelyn. And so? I would just like to uh, compliment what Stella said about um, the Amazon rainforest, uh, we have been seeing cases of uh, mercury poisoning in the Yanomami people. Uh, they're, a, they're a village, they're a community of people that live in the Amazon rainforest. And we have been seeing lately uh, some cases of mercury poisoning because of, um, I, I don't want to say illegal, but uh, excavations and in the Amazon rainforest and uh, some some things that some uh, for example iron and uh, emerald search in uh, in the Amazon rainforest have been uh, poisoning the the rivers and the lakes in Brazil and so then when the Yanomami people drink the water they get poisoned uh, with mercury and so many people have died because of that about 60, 70 people, and uh, that is a problem that we need to uh, that we need to think about. I totally agree. Um, I think for time constraints, we're going to move on to the next few questions, but please do keep um, conversing in the chat. I'm seeing some really good points over here regarding AI, education. It's amazing over here. Yeah, I really hope that we capture um, these the the chat because <laughs> there's some great things in here. Yeah, the discussions here are amazing, guys. Amazing. Um, so if I can, oh, uh, uh -oh. sorry. Okay, so yeah. our next question. Yeah, a lot of people have been um, talking about what they're learning in school and. Um, Brian Alexander in particular has been asking what you're learning in school about these issues with regard to, you know, 
um, the rainforest and AI. And, and so and when we think about what you're learning in school, are you learning enough to prepare yourselves for, for the future that you want to see? Gabrielle? Gabriella, I'm sorry. You're on mute. Yeah, so um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I would just like to say that um, here, at least um, in my school, we don't like have classes about like AI because they're not like on the subject. We can like discuss about AI and the rainforest in like geography or other classes, but we don't have like the subject to talk about those things. I would also, I, I know it's it just like it when we went already through that question, but we we also forgot about the CO2, like car, carbon, a carbono, carbon, carbon that for the deforestation produces, because here in Brazil, at least, um, the most the the biggest way to produce carbon it's not like the pollution or the airplanes but the deforestation from the rainforest and yeah but about the ai and stuff i think that um the ai is a big problem here also in brazil because of the fake news and everything because here in brazil it's really common to see people even like presidents uh, posting and fake news like going all over the internet and no one saying no that's fake or they just like go all over and went, go viral and that's a really big problem that I think that with the AI it is gonna like grow even more and I believe that in the US and all, all over the world it's also like that as here in Brazil, yeah. Thank you, Gabriella. Francisco. Some wonderful points. Sorry, I'm just gonna jump in again. Oh, um, sure. Um, regarding AI, like what you said is very interesting and it's definitely something we need to be thinking about going forward. Like you're already seeing it with artists, like AI is using art that has already po been posted on the web like of other artists to create whatever it generates and this was seen with um google as well like any writing the ai puts out it's from people uh, things that people have been storing in their drives and obviously we need to be thinking more about how the law can incorporate like safeguards for this sort of thing like how do we prevent this from happening because you're just taking s someone else's stuff like some one uh something someone else has put hard work into and you're just regurgitating it out at people like is this is not ethical and i think the law should be accommodating for things like this like we should be addressing it more um uh, next one to speak um francisco so uh i would like to add on what you're just saying a, just that a little I just a little a little note please uh before you continue we have five minutes to finish so if you can make it shorter and coming to the to the end i have a fi final remarks please okay yeah um so then i think we'll uh skip on to the next uh few things um please continue in the chat box uh so the next question we've got is, what do we need to do to stop history from repeating itself? Like we're already seeing it right now. History is repeating itself. Um, the Israel-Palestine conflict, it's come up again. Um, lots of things are coming up again that have been going on like from centuries ago. So is this right? Like if we're trying to move forward, is it correct that stop mistakes that have been going on from long time back is it right that these things are still happening? Like, what do we need to do to stop all of this from happening? Please just put like your answers in the chat or unmute. Uh, um, yeah, Enzo, your hand was up. Uh, 
Yeah, we have five minutes more. Then okay. uh, we can close. Okay. okay. So if everybody who's who's got your hand raised, if you could um keep your remarks to one minute, then that'll that's four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Julia. Okay, Pedro. Uh yeah, um can you listen? Yeah, I, is it working? I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I think um, even though AI is pretty scary and people say it's going to steal jobs, um, it is pretty, I think it's pretty obvious that in the future, AI is going to be much more advanced than it is today. And uh, obviously, they're going to do some fact checking on, I, I don't know how it's going to work. I don't really know much about that. But I think it could be very useful, used in the right way for uh, education, uh, coming back to the last question. Um, and yeah, that's that's just it. I, I think uh, AI could be very useful if used in the right way. But right now, it's not actually being used in the right way. Uh, people are making fake news of um, betting um, sites on Brazil, like online casinos, using uh, AI generated videos of famous people like uh, Neymar and are are present right now. Um, it's it's really crazy and it's it's pretty scary. But I think if used in the right way, it could be very useful for education. Yeah, coming back to the last question. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a little bit more. You can you can you have I more five have, minutes. Okay, I have five minutes. We have time for I think two more. We haven't heard from Sophia, so I'm gonna ask Sophia to come off mute. Um, hello. Well. I would like to speak a bit about the AI as well. I am in the art community. I really like to draw. And also I have been following what's been happening with AI by generating fake images, stealing from other people's people work. However, there's also the fact that AI now is getting a lot better and people are, uh, it's being used to make videos take videos of real people, which is really dangerous. So it's really important that we can guarantee that laws are made to stop people from doing those things with AI because it can be really harmful for someone's reputation. And it's just really dangerous. So we must be really careful with it. And if there are no laws, it's going to be a problem that we have to deal with later. So it would be very good if we could start taking care of it now. Thank you, Sophia. And then, okay, so um, we haven't heard from Nicholas, so I'm gonna go to Nicholas. Last, Nicholas has the last word. I think we're gonna have to wrap up after that. So um, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit. It's about the rainforest, but it still kind of applies from how to stop uh, history from repeating itself. Okay. Um, so while I think it's really important to stop the deforestation of the rainforest, uh, we have to be careful because it's a really polemic theme. So it's like a really, I think people like to argue about. So uh, it's a topic in which people can very often be, uh, well, manipula manipulated a little bit uh, because we hear, especially in uh, politics. So people have to be a little careful with it. Okay. Well, thank you, Rosa. I think well, you're- um, uh, Thank you uh, for the great uh, facilitation. For, and incredible that I see here that many, many young people from Brazil, have, uh, very wise uh, young people, uh, with a social environmental conscience. Um, I'm curious, are you from a single school or are you from different parts? Um, I'm Brazilian for sure, as you can see. Uh, how did you get uh, information from the event? Just for us to um, measure our channels. So we're all from the same um, school, but three different campuses. Uh -huh. So, I mean, it's the same group, but there's some schools in, there's one, two of those in Sao Paulo, one of those in a 
nearby city. Ah. So yeah, it's something from the school. How did you get to know about the event? Uh, it was from uh, email or uh, uh, social um, media? No, it was like our English counselor. So ah. I don't I don't know how it is from other campuses, but at okay. least for, from mine, it was mm -hmm. the English counselor there that commented about it and like asked people to volunteer. So that's how we actually got to know Amazing. it. Amazing. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Good to see that uh, we've been going to the schools. Um, uh, it was incredible, incredible talk. Thank you for all for, the, for this uh, privileged uh, conversation. Uh, I learned a lot and uh, we are reaching the end of our time together. Uh, we want to thank you all uh, for participating uh, in the World Future Day, Young Voices 2024. I wish you a very happy World Future Day that is going on to the, uh, to, there are more countries on board uh, in the next session. Uh, there will be new facilitators and conversations happening on, on the hour. Uh, if you can stay here, if you are available, we encourage you to stay on the next uh, session. In the chat box, we, we dropped some uh, participation for survey and uh, in information about it is the future movement. You can fill also your the, 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 re the survey to receive a certification of participation and uh, to receive the videos and activities also based on playbook. Uh, so the, the information is on the chat. Okay, so have a wonderful time. Uh, hope you can stay for the next session. Thank you. Thank you, Sabina. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. Thank you uh, for this great session and uh, hope to see you next time. Bye-bye. So um, I just want to point out that the um, that a, a Concha yeah. and I are on LinkedIn. So you can okay. look up yes. on LinkedIn. And I do hope, I just want to say, if you don't mind, Rosa, we've got three minutes left. I sure. do hope that we can, um, you know, that the youth, that I heard comments about Malaysia. I heard comments about Brazil. I heard comments about South Africa. Um, do, actually, in these last few minutes, can you all just put where you're calling in from um, in the chat? Because clearly, um, there needs to be a, we need to bring all of you around the world together um, to talk about these issues because you, quite frankly, I feel like we have the UN right here. So um, again, thank you all for participating. I see Brazil, Brazil, Brazil. <laughs> Is there anything? <laughs> That's wonderful. I, I just, you know, it's so good to see. So Rosa, if you do, uh, you know, some type of um, event in, in Brazil, please let me know because I'd love to come and hang out with all these great young people. Oh, don't, don't forget that if there is an opportunity, I will call you. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So we're about two minutes before the next session starts. Um, Thank you. And I'm Akancha, gonna go ahead and again, drop. I want to thank you. Akancha is is going to be going to university in the fall, so yeah. she's finishing up. Anybody else, a uh, senior, and looking forward to university? Uh, I'm I'm a senior, but I'm only going to university next year because in Brazil it's it's the system is different. But yeah, I'm in my last year. Awesome, oh, awesome. Oh, I see India. Hey, I'm from India too. I'm currently joining you guys from the UAE, though. It's almost 10 over here. And um, I'm going to go ahead and drop our uh, LinkedIn links in the chat in case anyone wants to continue the conversation. Please do. It was so nice to see all of you. And I really hope we can connect and continue this amazing conversation. We